In this virtual tour of Guadalcanal, I will describe the places that we visit on my annual tour of Guadalcanal and Tulagi with Valor Tours. I will supplement my photos with period photos from the war and maps to describe the major battles. This virtual tour of Guadalcanal complements my lecture series on the Battle of Guadalcanal, which is also available on YouTube. This was my first view of Guadalcanal in January 2005 when I was on a cruise through the Solomon Islands. In this photo, we are anchored off of Red Beach. This is how I imagine the Marines of the 1st Marine Division saw Guadalcanal for the first time on the morning of August 7, 1942. Our tour starts in Los Angeles. We fly Fiji Airways, sometimes called Pacific Air. We depart LAX in the evening and cross the Pacific, losing a day when we cross the International Dateline. We have an intermediary stop in Nandi, Fiji, arriving early the next morning. We do not go through immigration, but head straight to the transit lounge where we spend a few hours. It is a comfortable lounge with many of the shops and amenities that we have in large airports in the States. We board a smaller plane, usually a 737, for the flight to Guadalcanal. If you are fortunate to get a window seat and it's not too cloudy, you might get to see some atolls and reefs. This is the usual flight path coming up from Fiji, approaching Henderson Field from the east. This is my preferred approach coming in from the west. I like this approach better because of the views of Lunga Point, Henderson Field, and the hills and jungles of Guadalcanal. This is a good view of Henderson Field setting up for an approach from the west. In this view, we get a good look at Bloody Ridge behind Henderson and Alligator Creek just beyond the threshold of the runway. Here are some views of the jungle and rivers to the west of Henderson. Here is a nice view of the western end of the 1942 runway. The river above the runway is the Lunga River. This is a photo of the approach to Henderson from the west. The entire 1942 marine perimeter is in this photo. Here is where Red Beach is located. This is where Fighter 1 and Fighter 2 were located. Today the only things that take off from Fighter 2 are golf balls. It is the local golf course. We drive by it several times during our stay in Haniara. Here are some of the grassy hills that dominate the plain between the jungle and Iron Bottom Sound. By the way, the official name of Iron Bottom Sound is Sea Lark Channel. In the haze in the distance to the left is Cape Esperance, site of the Japanese evacuation in February 1943. Savo Island is barely visible in the distance on the right. Here is a view of the apex of the Lunga Point and the mouth of the Lunga River. Even though it was a cloudy day, the Florida Islands are clearly visible on the horizon about 25 miles away. Tulagi is off the photo to the left. Here is the final approach to Henderson coming in from the west. This is a nice view of the dominant terrain feature as seen from Henderson, Mount Austin. We will visit the top of Mount Austin to see the Japanese observation posts on the right of the grassy summit. This is the Henderson Field Airport Terminal. There is no jetway to disembark from the plane. After we deplane, we go through immigration through the doors on the far left of the building. Here is an aerial view of Henderson with the old runways outlined in red and the current runway extending to Alligator Creek where the Battle of the Teneru was fought on August 21st. 
Here is the site of the Battle of Bloody Ridge on September 12th and 13th. Here is the site of the Battle of Henderson Field on October 24th and 25th. All three of these battles were fought at the perimeter. This is the Memorial Tree Garden next to Henderson. We will have a couple of opportunities to visit this memorial during our stay. This map shows the extent of the perimeter after the arrival of the Americal Division. With the arrival of the Americal Division, General Vandegrift finally had enough men to form a cordoned defensive perimeter. Note the Matanikau and Point Cruz outside the perimeter. This is what Point Cruz looked like in 1942. This is what Point Cruz looks like today. Here is the Mendana Hotel where we stayed during our time on Guadalcanal. Next door is the famous Yacht Club, site of the Doug Monroe Memorial, which we will hear more about later. This is the Mendana Hotel and the Yacht Club. This is the dining room of the Mindana Hotel where we eat our meals. The food is good and reasonably priced. This is the hotel pool outside the dining room. It is a popular area to get together after hiking around the battlefields to discuss our favorite topic, the Battle of Guadalcanal. This is a night shot of the pool and a patio outside the dining room. Point Cruz is in the distance on the left. Next to bottled water, this is the favorite drink in the Solomons, Sol Brew. It is available at the hotel dining room and at the yacht club next door. This is the main drag through Haniara. It passes in front of our hotel. As the Solomons were under British control before the Americans occupied it during the war, traffic drives on the left. So be sure to look both ways before crossing the street. The Solomon Islanders are friendly people and you should have no fear walking down the street during the day. The first place I take my passengers on our tour is the American Memorial on Hill 73. Here I will describe the battle in general and point out important landmarks that can be seen from the memorial. There are a few interesting stories I will tell the group when we visit the memorial including the history of the memorial. The memorial is the site of a solemn sunrise ceremony on the morning of August 7th, the anniversary of the invasion. It is always well attended and one of the highlights of our tour as we are participants in the ceremony. This is the American Memorial with Mount Austin in the background. This is a typical group on my tour. Jeffrey on the right is our local guide. I like to get a group photo at the memorial. Note the plaque in the middle of the star. This is a memorial to the unknown warrior. During the excavation of the memorial, some bones were discovered buried in a shallow grave. A ring was on one of the finger bones with the initials J.H.B., but nothing else to suggest who it might be. There were no dog tags to identify the remains. My mentor, the late Guadalcanal historian John Ennis did a study about L Company 3rd Battalion 5th Marines and their action on Hill 73 on August 18th and 19th. They were the first Marines to cross the Matanikau. They were on a patrol and bivouacked on Hill 73 for the night. A Japanese mortar killed Marine Sergeant John Harold Brannock. He was buried on the hill and the company continued their mission. John put two and two together and began to think that the Marines' remains were those of John Brannock, but this was not conclusive evidence of the identity. More evidence was needed. The remains were repatriated to Hawaii, where DNA analysis confirmed the identity of the remains of those of John Harold Brannock. The plaque to the unknown warrior remained on the memorial site for several years after the identification was confirmed. When I returned to Guadalcanal in 2018, the plaque had been replaced with a new plaque to the warrior, who we now know is Sergeant John Harold Brannock. The tri-folded flag 
here being presented to John Brannock's cousin, flew over the American memorial before being sent to the States for a full military burial ceremony of John Brannock, who was buried in Arlington Cemetery. This is one of the touching stories I tell my passengers on our tour and visit to Hill 73 and the American memorial. Another reason for visiting the American Memorial is to point out views of the more important landmarks of the battle. Looking east from the memorial is the Matanikau River over which five major battles were fought. On the horizon and to the right is the Gifu and Hill 27. I hold off telling the stories about these positions until we visit them later in the tour. I point out the valley on the other side of the Matanikau this was the site of action that included the embedded journalist John Hershey, who wrote about the ensuing battle in his book, Into the Valley. Except for the houses scattered on the hillside, the valley today looks pretty much like it did in 1942. Directly south of the memorial are the hills that comprise what the Americans called Galloping Horse, also known as the 50 series, because the hills that make up Galloping Horse were all numbered in the 50s. Unlike most hills on battle maps, which are labeled according to their height above sea level, because most of the hills were all about the same height, they were instead numbered in the order in which they were encountered moving east to west. The hills that make up Bloody Ridge are hills 1 and 2. Going west, the numbers get larger, nearly to Cape Esperance. The job of taking the hills of Galloping Horse went to the 25th Infantry Division, also known as the Tropic Lightning Division, out of Schofield Barracks, Hawaii. A member of F Company was a corporal named James Jones, who was wounded in the battle. After the war, he wrote a fictional account of the battle entitled The Thin Red Line. In his book, he refers to what is Galloping Horse as the Dancing Elephant. Here is a close-up looking southeast of Hill 27 and the Gifu. If you look closely, you can see a small white Japanese memorial just to the left of the summit of Hill 27. We will visit Hill 27 later in the tour, where I will describe the Battle of the Gifu. The Japanese tried three times to retake Henderson Field. Each attempt failed with grievous losses to the Japanese. The first of these attempts was the Battle of the Tenaru. This is one of the first battlefields we will visit on our tour. Here is my group hiking from the east toward the Elu River, also called Alligator Creek by the locals, and erroneously called the Tenaru. The Tenaru and Elu Rivers were mislabeled on the only maps the Marines had at the time. It was initially called the Battle of the Tenaru, and the name has stuck to this day. My group is walking along the same stretch of beach that the Japanese marched on during the night of August 20th and 21st. The creek is called Alligator Creek for a reason. In my previous nine trips to Guadalcanal, I have never seen any alligators, but we keep our distance just the same. We usually approach Alligator Creek from the east the same direction Colonel Lechiki and his men approached the Marine perimeter. On the Marine side of the creek, the west side, where they had set up defensive positions, we can get very close to where Johnny Rivers, Lee Diamond, and Al Schmidt had their 30 caliber machine gun foxhole. I recount the story of their action that night. In this photo, we are close to that foxhole position. Here we are on the sand spit where hundreds of Japanese bodies were piled up on the morning after the battle. The mouth of Alligator Creek looks pretty much like it did in 1942. I recommend to my group that the best souvenir from Guadalcanal is sand from the beaches where battles were fought. It is inert and goes through customs without any problems. In my opinion, one of the most important battles of World War II was the Battle of Bloody Ridge fought in mid-September. To me, it is the icon battle of Guadalcanal. Here is a photo of Bloody Ridge looking south. Hill 2 is in the foreground. Hill 1 and the front line on September 12th and 13th is in the trees further south. 
This is a memorial service on Hill 1 to my late friend and mentor, John Ennis, during our 2019 tour. I did seven tours with John before he passed away in 2018. When we visit Bloody Ridge, we start on Hill 2, where I begin the description of the battle and where we can see some foxholes and other firing positions. We then walk the length of the ridge to Hill 1, where I finish the account of the battle. This white marker is a memorial to the Japanese Sendai Division, which fought not at Bloody Ridge, but in the Battle of Henderson Field just east of Hill 1 during the October action. One of the highlights of our visit to Bloody Ridge is walking down Hill 1 toward the Japanese lines. This is what we want to see at the bottom of Hill 1, barbed wire left over from the war. This is how the Bob wire looked in 1942, and this is how it looks today. This stuff is all over the battlefields. This is one of the pigtail posts for stringing Bob wire that we find on Bloody Ridge. These are bullet wounds. Here is one of our passengers walking through the tall kunai grass toward Hill 1 from the jungle to the east. From Hill 1, we can see in the distance this grassy hill. This was where Sergeant Ralph Briggs had his observation post the first night of the Battle of Henderson Field. He was here with a platoon of 7th Marines. He telephoned his battalion commander, Colonel Chesty Puller, to inform him that a large Japanese force was heading his way. This position was well in front of the Marine lines. After making his report, Briggs and his platoon made their way through the rain back to American lines. Another highlight of our visit to Bloody Ridge is visiting John Bazalone's foxhole. The hike to this position, however, is not for everybody. It involves hiking through some jungle and over some steep hillsides. It is about a 20-minute hike, but it is well worth the effort to get to this famous spot of the battle. The exploits of Sergeant Bazalone are nicely recounted in the episode about the Battle of Guadalcanal in the HBO miniseries, The Pacific. Here is a spur off Hill 1 heading east into the jungle to Bazalone's foxhole. The first part of this hike is relatively easy over flat ground to the jungle. Once we reach the trees, the hiking gets a bit more difficult as we encounter some steep hills. The guy on the right is our local guide, Jeffrey. I have worked with Jeffrey on three tours, and he is a joy to have along on our tours. He is a Solomon Islander, lives in Haniara, and is knowledgeable about the battle. In addition to his help with the history of the battle, he is our liaison with the local Solomon Islanders. The guy on the left with the machete is with us only when we go to Bazlone's foxhole. He hacks away any of the foliage that impedes our hike through the jungle. After a 20 minute hike, we reach the spot where we are confident John Bazlone fought during the Battle of Henderson Field on the nights of October 25th and 26th, 1942. Bazlone was all over the front line that night, running from machine gun to machine gun and back of the lines for more ammunition. We have found Springfield clips, N1 clips, mortar plates, and lots of barbed wire nearby. Another, much easier hike we take is to Coffin Corner. Our bus takes us within a quarter mile of the corner, then we hike along flat ground through this underbrush. We also find lots of war relics nearby. St. Joseph Teneru is another important place we visit. St. Joseph Teneru is on a plain east of the perimeter where an important battle was fought a few days after the Battle of Bloody Ridge. It is now a school for young Solomon Islanders. After the battle in February 1943, Guadalcanal was used for training and staging to other battles in the Southwest Pacific Theater. A hospital and morgue were also established at Guadalcanal for treating wounded and processing KIAs for burial. Here is the morgue from the war. Note that the siding and door are made from marts and matting. This stuff is ubiquitous in the Pacific and is still used by locals to build houses and fences. Here is the old hospital, also made from Marston matting. 
This part of the Teneru River is a short walk from the hospital and morgue. This part of the river is the site of some action in September involving six Stuart light tanks, one of which flipped over into the river here, drowning the crew. The Kuma Battalion, part of the Ichiki Detachment that arrived too late for the Battle of Bloody Ridge, was defeated in a firefight just west of this part of the river in the Battle of the Overland Trail. This is a pump used in the war to supply water from the river to the hospital. It is still a functioning pump. Mount Austin is the main terrain feature as seen from Henderson Field. It was outside the original marine perimeter and the location of a Japanese observation post. To get to the top of Mount Austin, we drive up this road, which was named the Wright Road, in memory of Lieutenant Colonel William Wright, an American Army officer killed in the Battle of the Gifu. I took this photo from the Japanese memorial, which we stopped to visit. At the top of the hill, the road comes to a fork. The left fork goes to the top of Mount Austin. The right fork goes to the Barana village, the Gifu, and Hill 27. We visit each site in the same day. Our bus gets us to the top of the hill. We then hike across the crest to see the Japanese observation post on the far side by that tree. It is a relatively easy hike along the path through the grass. From the top of Mount Austin, we get this view of Henderson Field. It is easy to see why the Japanese had an observation post up here. On a clear day, we can see the Floridas in the distance, as we can in this photo. This is a view of Savo Island from Hill 66. Taking the right fork at the top of the hill along the right road takes us to the Barana village, the Gifu, and Hill 27. The Barana village is a Catholic village established in 1982. The village moved into what was the Japanese stronghold called the Gifu. We stop here every year. The people are friendly and will try very hard to sell you war relics that they have accumulated from the jungle around their village. Here is a typical village house. This is another house with some of the villagers who come out when we arrive. Here are some of the village children. They are friendly, if not shy. These are some of the Japanese and American war relics that villagers have dug up from the Gifu, which they try to sell you. I recommend to my passengers that they not buy any of this stuff, as it will be very difficult to get through customs. An Australian lady once tried to get an inert hand grenade through customs with not surprising results. If you look carefully, you may find Springfield clips and cartridges on some of the battlefields. I tell my passengers that the best souvenir to take home is sand from the invasion beaches. Here are some more war relics on display at the Barana village. One year I found these two shells. One appears to be a 75mm artillery shell and the other is a 60mm mortar shell. Unexploded ordnance is still scattered around Guadalcanal, but do not go looking for it. If you find one, do not touch it. People have been killed by these recently. After spending some time in the village looking at the war relics, we hike up to the top of Hill 27. As you can see, it is not a difficult hike. Except for the worn path, this is pretty much how the hill looked in 1942 when the Americans occupied it. Once we reach the top, I point out some of the terrain features that can be seen from here. I also describe the Battle of the Gifu and the events of the battle that took place on top of and around Hill 27. On a clear day like this one, we can see Cape Esperance to the west. This was the site of the Japanese evacuation in February 1943. The hills in the foreground on the left are the hills that make up what the Americans called Seahorse, a pair of hills that included Hill 44. These were taken by the American 35th Infantry in January 1943. The hills just beyond Seahorse are the 50 series that make up what the Americans called Galloping Horse. These were taken by the 27th Infantry also in January 1943. 
The Matanikau River runs between Seahorse and Galloping Horse through the tree-lined valley here. These hills can be seen from Hill 27. Here is an overhead photo and a corresponding map of Seahorse and Galloping Horse. The Matanikau River runs between the two before emptying into Iron Bottom Sound. In this view from Hill 27, we can see both hills of Seahorse, Hills 43 and 44. This is the jungle as seen from Hill 27 looking east. This is Red Beach, where the 1st Marine Division landed on the morning of August 7, 1942. Cape Esperance can be seen in the distance, as can Lunga Point. This is pretty much how Red Beach looked in 1942. On a clear day, as we had on this day, the Florida Islands can easily be seen on the horizon across Iron Bottom Sound. I will conclude this virtual tour of Guadalcanal in Part 2.